Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 15th of August, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So a lot to go through today. The weekend was quite eventful. There is a lot of, uh, I guess you could call it drama, a lot of uh, things being talked about right now in the fallout of the Tornado Cash stuff that we saw last week. Now, I did obviously touch on the Tornado Cash uh, stuff last week, but there's been a lot that happened over the weekend that I want to go over. And I want to start with this tweet that, that I put out, which is my main conclusion from all of this. So I said, I think the main conclusion I've come to from recent events is that Ethereum is more of a concern to governments, nation states than Bitcoin is. The implications of this will define the next few years of this industry. Now, I think this is a really important point, um, not just because I said it, I've seen other people say similar things, but I think it's really important to understand that Bitcoin is no longer the battleground of crypto, right? I believe it's Ethereum. And this is obviously by virtue of the fact that Ethereum can do a lot more than Bitcoin can. But there is no kind of like attacks or sanctions happening on Bitcoin related apps, for example, right? For From things built on Bitcoin, because you can't build things on Bitcoin. There have been uh, addresses sanctioned in the past, and there has been kind of like mixes shut down and stuff like that, but not in the way that we've seen with Tornado Cash. So a Tornado Cash built on Ethereum is more of a threat to, I guess, like the US government's interests than Bitcoin is, which I think is, is a pretty profound uh, thing to kind of like just take in there and take on board. Now, because of this, uh, I don't think Tornado Cash is going to be the last thing that threatens the government's and nation states' interest. I actually have never viewed Ethereum as something that uh, was kind of like well, like Bitcoin, where it's like, oh, you know, we, we kind of like really hate all, all the governments around the world. We... Um, we we want we, we think the world's gonna we're gonna end, fiat's gonna collapse, all these sorts of stuff. I never viewed Ethereum as like a Duma network, like what Bitcoin kind of tends to position itself as. I always viewed Ethereum as a more optimistic kind of network where we build things, we build better things, and we build things that give people more freedom. Now, obviously, that freedom is being challenged with all the censorship that we're seeing. I think people really underestimate how important it is that blockchains, uh, I guess, like keep their censorship resistant properties, because if they don't have that, then they're kind of useless, right? Like if a blockchain just becomes somewhere where we have all these lists that have to be censored, all these address, all these applications that have to be censored on the whims of kind of like a government, then it's really just FinTech 2.0 or TradFi 2.0. It's not really what we're trying to build here. But I also think that a lot of people are getting the wrong idea about things because they're not separating out the concerns. They're actually bucketing everything into one kind of like bucket. And just because like a front end um, senses something, it means Ethereum is not censorship resistant anymore at the protocol level. And I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. So there are multiple levels to censorship resistance in Ethereum, right? Obviously, if you go from bottom to top, it would be the Ethereum protocol itself, the miners and the validators, obviously, uh, in a, in a post-merge world. That is the, I guess, like, this first line of defense, or I guess, depending how you look at it, last line of defense, right? That is the bottom of, of kind of like the list here. And then you can go up a level to the smart contracts built on Ethereum. Then you can go to uh, the middleware that sits between the smart contracts and the front ends. Then you can go to the front ends. Then you can go uh, to the assets as well, the assets that interact with these sorts of things. Uh, the RPCs as well, I guess like the RPCs would probably be above the, uh, sorry, ab just above the protocol um, before the smart contracts because you would need the RPC to interact with the smart contracts. Um, but I think uh, it's kind of weird because RPC, I guess, could be considered a middleware. So you would have that like where the oracles are, maybe on the side. But I think guess the ordering of it doesn't really matter too much. It's just recognizing that there are multiple layers here. There's not just one layer that you, okay, well, if this layer got censored, it means everything's censored. No. Now, what are the example of each of these things? Well, on the Ethereum protocol layer, for there to be censorship, it would require miners and validators to purposely be blocking uh, transactions uh, or manually kind of like dropping uh, transactions and not confirming them due to a government order. So for example, this would be the uh, miners basically saying, well, we're not going to process any transactions that touch Tornado Cash because uh, Tornado Cash is on the yeah, kind of like uh, OFAC list of sanction sanctions in the US. Then at the smart contract, level, it would be uh, the smart contracts themselves having censorship built in. So for example, you could have a DeFi app that basically has the smart contracts, but says, okay, well, we're not going to allow this address or this address to interact with our, our smart contracts, right? Our protocol. So that's smart contract level censorship. Then you have the RPCs themselves, which are basically nodes you talk to to relay your, tr relay your transaction transactions. They can do the same thing that miners and validators do where they basically say, well, we're going to drop your transactions. We're not going to let you get them into the, I guess, like mempool because we, uh, because you, uh, you know, you're sanctioned or we just kind of like don't like you or some, whatever reason, right? They, they reserve the right to, I guess, like have their reasons there. 
Uh, and then you have the oracles, of course. So for example, if, uh, I mean, a chain link, for example, wanted to, they could say, well, we're not going to serve our oracles to such and such or such and such, right? That's Oracle level censorship there. Uh, then you have front ends, which I think we're most acutely aware of because pretty much all the front ends seem to be sticking to this kind of like censorship that they're uh, on the sanction side of things. Um, and that basically just means that the front end doesn't let you access uh, access uh, the kind of like back end that it's talking to. So for example, uh, actually I have a perfect example here of uh, myself actually sassel.eth being blocked from the official fr uh, Aave front end uh, because I had 0.1 ETH uh, sent to my wallet via Tornado Cash from that troll that was kind of like sending it to people. So I wasn't able to access the Aave front end, which means I wasn't able to use the Aave front end to talk to the smart contracts. Now, that doesn't mean that the smart contracts were blocking me, the, the RPC wasn't blocking me, uh, nothing else was blocking me, it was just the front end here. And obviously you can use other front ends and you can even interact with the smart contracts directly as well. So, so it's not like you're censored on every single level. I, I've, I just got censored on one level and this has since been reversed. I think they kind of like removed uh, everyone off that list and aren't blocking anyone right now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is an example of a front end kind of like censorship uh, that, that kind of like happens here. So th there are multiple levels here, guys. Like it's not just the one one kind of like um, uh, one all encompassing thing. And I think that's where a lot of nuance gets lost. The biggest concern people have when it comes to censorship is censorship at the protocol layer because there's no other layers, right? Like there's nothing else we can do. I mean, there is technically a social layer with, that would come, I guess, like just below the protocol layer but the social layer itself only has so much power. Like you could basically say, well, uh, you know, you could condemn the action. You could basically, I guess, like signal to them that you're not going to use the app. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that, right? So that definitely plays a big part in it. And I think, I mean, it all starts from the social layer anyway, but protocol level kind of censorship is is really bad because it basically means that the kind of like transactions, no matter what you do, will not be able to get into the mempool. You won't be able to get those transactions processed uh, because you've been censored uh, either via sanctions or some other kind of like... Um, or some other kind of entity is 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 um is censoring you. So that is like the the end game right there, and that's what everyone is very concerned about. Now there is a kind of like thing here that uh, Flashbots, which is kind of like a relayer for MEV related transactions, uh, they have a, 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 a software called MEV Boost, and they actually put the OFAC blacklist on this software. That basically said, well, if uh, anyone is trying to, inter to interact with the, the Tornado Cash addresses, then don't process those transactions. Actions. Now, this is, um, I guess, like a middleware. MEV boost can be considered a middleware that bolts onto a validator or bolts onto a miner that allows them to do MEV related things. Putting a blacklist there, especially if it's enabled by default uh, and, and it's kind of like an opt out thing rather than opt in thing, is really concerning because this is protocol level or well, protocol layer censorship. That's kind of like going on here. Now, you can see here that Micah Zoltu basically put together a pull request saying, you know, let's remove this blacklist because it doesn't really make any sense to, to have this in there. I think that if you want to have a blacklist in there, you just should do it as like an opt-in thing. It shouldn't be an opt-out thing. So it should be a conscious decision of the, I guess, validators or of the... Um, of the uh, kind of like uh, people that, that are using MEV Boost to opt into something like this. So that's, I guess, like something that I'll link in the YouTube description for you to check out the discussion here. But that's another way that these things can happen where you have these kind of like middleware protocols like MEV Boost that can affect protocol layer censorship. And on that front as well, uh, there was a tweet here, I believe from a one way function related to this, where they said, you know, the law around the sanctions is very simple. It requires no US person or company to do business with Tornado Cash. Relaying transactions that you do not initiate is not doing business with Tornado Cash. Verifying that a transaction is mathematically valid is not doing business with Tornado Cash. People are just freaking out for no reason. And this speaks to a lot of what we've seen, I guess, over the last few uh, days where the front ends especially have been going above and beyond to do things that aren't actually legally required of them to do. As One Way Function said here, there is no legal obligation for these front ends to be censoring like this. They just have to basically uh, not do business with, uh, well, no US person technically do business with Tornado Cash, the, the, the sanctioned addresses. But as you can see, when I got blocked from Aave, it was because I had received uh, uh, funds from Tornado Cash. It wasn't the uh, kind of like address that 
was sanctioned because my address wasn't sanctioned by the US. So why am I blocked? Uh, and as one way function says, yeah, just, uh, you know, relaying transactions uh, that you did not initiate is not doing business with Tornado Cash. So we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot here, which I'm pretty disappointed in. Like, I feel like there's a lot of fight at the social layer. There's a lot of people who care deeply about censorship resistance and maintaining the values of Ethereum. But then there's kind of like this push pull to it where we're pushing that kind of like uh, that that info out into the in the world, but the people that are kind of like running these front ends and stuff like that. They're just going above and beyond. Now, whether this is based on, I guess, advice that they're getting from their lawyers, which probably are extremely conservative, or whether this is just them being like, well, I'm in the US, I don't want to risk anything. I don't want to go to jail for 30 years because the penalties are quite steep, right? For the OFAC-related penalties, I mean, it's up to 30 years in federal prison or it is uh, massive fines or both, right? So you obviously don't want to get on the wrong side of that. But going above and beyond like this is what I was talking about last week with that chilling effect where all the OFAC needed to do was sanction these addresses and suddenly they've been able to kind of like uh in the matter of a few days get people censoring the front ends get people talking about uh censoring at the protocol layer all right and get having uh flash bots put in an OFAC blacklist like guys like this is as I said literally shooting ourselves in the foot so it's not something that we should even be entertaining and I'm I, like honestly if I'm if I was to say what I'm most disappointed about it's that it's not the sanctions themselves it's the fact that we rolled over so easily and I don't believe it's like a a, a kind of um um a uh, fundamental uh, kind of like thing. I don't believe it is a systemic thing. I don't believe that it's something that we can't recover from, but I'm kind of disappointed. And I think it's because up until this point, we haven't really had any of this kind of like attention. Ethereum has existed in kind of a bubble. The most attention that we've had is probably from the SEC, which is a different beast altogether and a whole different kind of topic of discussion altogether. But I think now that the final boss is here, now that nation states have shown that they'll make these moves, while well, it's time for us to get serious about, you know, uh, kind of like uh, censorship resistance across all stacks like not just the protocol layer but the whole thing like the oracles the rpcs the front ends we need to be doing a lot more here to ensure that we uh, kind of like uphold that censorship resistance that we all uh you know claim to care about right because at the end of the day we can claim whatever we want but if the tech doesn't actually reflect the values that, that doesn't mean anything and there was a tweet actually a poll uh, just before that I kind of like voted on that asked, you know, if there was protocol level censorship as a permanent thing in Ethereum, would that mean Ethereum failed? And uh, I mean, absolutely, it would mean Ethereum failed. I would I would actually personally uh, leave the Ethereum ecosystem if that happened, if it was a permanent thing. Because if, the, as I said at the beginning, if you don't have censorship resistance, uh, especially at the at the base layer, then what the hell is the point of a blockchain uh, at the end of the day? Like you could just use a database. Like I'm not here to recreate the traditional system. I'm not here to create TradFi 2.0. I'm here to create something new, something that gives more freedom to people. So as I said, like I would leave the Ethereum ecosystem if there was permanent censorship at the base layer. Now, thankfully, this is something that's been spoken about and thought about for years. This is not something new. We've all been aware of the censorship risks um, uh, within kind of like blockchains for a very long time. Now, because of that, there are solutions. So you, you have heard me talk about proposer builder or PBS uh, separation or PBS before. Um, this is a way to kind of like affect... Um, or at least make it harder to do censorship resistance at the protocol layer. And then this could be coupled with something like CR list, which stands for censorship resistant list. Now, I'm going to link both of these in the YouTube description for you to check out yourselves. I'm not going to go through them uh, today, but the TLDR is basically what PBS does is it separates the proposer from the builder. So you have a, a specialized builder network uh, and then you have a proposer. So the the kind of um, uh, the, the, sep the concerns are separated. So the proposer just proposes blocks, the builders just build blocks instead of uh, the validators as they, as they exist today, doing both. Then you could have deniability over what you're proposing to, but it, the censorship moves to the builders in that case. And to rectify that problem, you use something like CR lists, which is basically... A, a list of kind of like uh, uh, ways to do censorship resistance here. So, uh, I mean, I, I recommend kind of like reading this uh, for for more uh, um, uh, for more information on this because it's definitely a very nuanced thing. But these are the things that we've been working on. On top of, I guess, like the social layer, the social pushing, which I think is very important. On top of uh, DVT or distributed validator technology to make it more make staking more decentralized. On top of decentralized staking pools. On top of the in protocol uh, things such as kind of like slashing. But the problem is, is that the, you can't slash for censorship unless the network comes together to do it in a social way. Censorship is actually the thing that is hardest to defend against because of that. Like it's a subjective thing. So for example, if the at the protocol layer, 
if the whole protocol or most of the protocol says, well, we're going to start censoring this address. Say they start censoring me for whatever reason. They say, we're not going to process any transactions coming from sasl.eth uh, and, and they start doing that at the base layer. To, to kind of like get around that is extremely subjective because I would have to convince everyone to basically say, hey, I'm being censored. Can you slash these people that are censoring me so we can get the network back to normal so I can stop being censored? No one's going to do that. Like not even for, I mean, I don't even think people would do it for someone like Vitalik, right? Like it, it, it obviously, Obviously, there are kind of like different people with different kind of like levels of um, of kind of like awareness around them, but like any censorship at all is bad because of this, right? So, and, and as I said, it's very hard to achieve this because you can't do, um, as far as I understand, that you can't do objective slashing of of um, of censorship. But maybe maybe you can. Like I, I I haven't read up on this for a little while now. I haven't checked the um, the spec itself, but from my understanding, you couldn't do that, and that was always the main concern. That's why things like PBS came out. That's why it's been so important to decentralize staking so that. Not, not, a, not a small handful of entities has enough stake to begin censoring people. So there's that. And there's also other things. Um, uh, there's one here from uh, Martin Koppelman who said, there is something called the shutterized beacon chain, which is a concept that allows uh, people to optionally encrypt transactions and get them included into the chain before the content is visible to anyone. It greatly improves censorship resistance and reduces malicious MEV. This is another thing actually that I tweeted about. Um, I may have skipped over the tweet. I think it was here. Yes. Yeah. So this is related to what I tweeted about where I said, I've been against base layer privacy for Ethereum in the past, but I'm slowly coming around to it if only to enable val validators to have complete deniability over which transactions they process. Um, so in this kind of like world, if Ethereum had base layer privacy where no one could see what the transactions contained, um, you could basically say to any authorities, hey, like, okay, yes, I'm a validator. I validated these, these kind of like transactions in this block, but I don't know what they are. Like no one can prove what they are. Like not even the authorities could say this is a malicious transaction because it's completely private. There's no way to know what they are, right? So there is actual plausible deniability. But the reason I've been against the base layer privacy is because of the fact that it makes uh, discovering bugs and exploits uh, uh, harder. It kind of like, um, it, it definitely op uh, opens up the attack surface a bit because now you have to worry about the, uh, I guess like the encryption that's backing up the privacy and all that sorts of stuff. So you definitely kind of like inc introduce more risk here and more complexity in into the protocol. And then Larry Cermak actually replied and said, you know, he still thinks it's a terrible idea because it would have a drastic effect on liquidity. Many exchanges would be forced to de delist it and also on institutional investability, which are other points that I haven't hadn't considered yet, but very, very good points there. Um, and then I think Suzaha actually had a great reply as well saying you can add threshold cryptography to PBS without making changes to the base layer. This solves two problems at once. Builders don't get their bundles stolen by validators and validators don't know what's in a transaction until it's committed, which I said was a good middle ground. Um, and I asked if this is something that we can do in theory today. Uh, and then Suzaha said, you know, it's something that we can do in theory today. Flashbots has done some work in this direction, uh, but the current idea is, use, is to use trusted hardware rather than uh, threshold crypto. And then there's all these issues with trusted hardware that people pointed out so you kind of like have this cat and mouse game when it comes to this sort of stuff where you kind of like okay well you caught the you caught the mouse and you're like yes okay we're all going to do it and then you, the mouse runs away again because there's some other kind of like thing you have to consider and all this sort of, uh, sort of stuff around it and i guess like that falls into what martin copperman was saying here about being able to um, not, you know, have base layer privacy, but optionally encrypt your transactions so that they can be included in the chain before the content is visible uh, to anyone. So these are all solutions that have been being worked on for uh, uh, quite a while now and have been theorized for quite a while now. So anyone that's kind of like out there, especially um, I've seen a lot of the Bitcoin maximalists do this, saying that like Ethereum is dead or the US government controls Ethereum or Ethereans don't care about censorship resistance and all those sorts of stuff is completely wrong. And some of them even said that we didn't see this coming. I mean, of course we did. Like, I think there is a point to be made that a lot in the Ethereum ecosystem were maybe naive about it or maybe kind of like they thought it was coming much later. But there have been plenty of people in this ecosystem that have talked about this for years and have been working on solutions. It's just that those solutions, because of the fact that we thought this was going to take longer to play out, um, were going to come later. So maybe we speed up those solutions and maybe we get them to mainnet uh, much faster now because of this. Because at the end of the day, like a nation state has, I mean, I wouldn't say they declared war on Ethereum, but they've uh, basically made their stance clear. They are and they will not hesitate to sanction addresses on Ethereum. And we have to work around that. We have to route around that. If we don't, as I said, we we like the end state would, would probably be base layer censorship. And that just wouldn't be interesting to me. I would leave the Ethereum ecosystem 
in that case. So there's all of that. Uh, I think there is two more things. Two more things? Yeah, two more things before I talk about some merge updates. Um, so Luke Youngblood here, who set up uh, Coinbase's staking, got into this thread with uh, Gabriel Shapiro here about Coinbase staking or US-based validators kind of like doing censorship and, and things like that. And Luke Youngblood said, um, one thing you might not know is that all of Coinbase retail Ethereum validators operate outside the US for tax purposes. So not only will they fight censorship to their last dying breath, it is a stretch for US regulators to censor transactions. Now it's cool that the validators are outside of the US, but keep in mind two things here. One, Luke doesn't work at Coinbase anymore, right? So he doesn't really have any say over this. Uh, I'm surprised he's even allowed to say this. Like I I would think that Coinbase would be against someone putting out this sort of signal um, if they're not working at the institution anymore. But he said it, right? And that's fine. I mean, I'm, I, and I like the fact that these validators are outside of the US, but it doesn't mean that Coinbase is going to kind of like not comply if they, if a government came to them. I, I fully believe that they would. If a government came to them and said, hey, you're running validators. We don't care that they operate outside the US. You are a US-based corporation. You are publicly trading on the NASDAQ. Um, uh, sorry, on the on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, you need to do this. They would probably do it or most likely do it. I don't see them fighting that, to be honest. And maybe I'm wrong here, but I don't think so. And this is why it's so important to make sure that yeah, staking is distributed, like that we don't have a bunch of kind of like three or four pools that have the majority of the stake that can do whatever they want or get be compelled to do uh, what governments want. Now, there are uh, there is a limits to what they can do. Like as I said, censorship is something that they can do relatively easily because it's hard for uh, at least right now because it's hard for us to punish that. But uh, other than that, I mean, there is in protocol things and there's there's slashing and stuff like that to disincentivize that. But I think also once withdrawals are enabled, you know, if if kind of like staking providers start doing this, you might see. A lot of people just pull out of that staking provider and saying, well, if you're going to be compelled to censor things, how can I trust you with my kind of like assets and, and pull out and go stake with someone else? There's also a lot of solutions around decentralized staking, such as Rocket Pool, uh, and, and you have kind of like uh, other uh, other centralized staking providers trying to decentralize uh, uh, or at least trying to kind of like distribute as much as possible. Obviously, as you guys know, Lido is not just a monolithic entity. There are, I believe, 28 or 29 validator services that they use, and they don't. And they only have a, like a I think the most one of them has is a few percent of, of the network, but we want to keep distributing that out. We don't want the uh, like three or four entities to be able to, I guess, like be compelled by a government because I think at the end of the day, I don't think that would collude. I don't think it's in their business interest to do so, but a nation state uh, kind of like compelling them to do something is the risk. And I actually wrote about this ages ago in my in, in my one of my newsletters where I said that I... I the only concern I have when it comes to centralized staking and centralized um, staking service providers and centralized exchanges and things like that was the nation state stuff. The nation states compelling these uh, services to do this. I had basically zero concerns over these services doing it themselves because, as I said, it's a bad business choice to do it on uh, on their own. But that doesn't take away from the fact that they could be compelled to do these sorts of things. So that's why we need all those solutions that I talked about. But we also need to make sure, especially in a post-withdrawal world, that we distribute stake as much as possible for the health of the network, for the health of, the health of Ethereum uh, just overall, and especially for the health of ETH as an asset. Because, you know, no one's going to want to buy ETH if it just becomes a censorship chain at the end of the day. So we have to uh, really be kind of like cognizant of that and keep working towards all of these solutions. Uh, and just last year, I, I just realized I went for almost the whole episode on this today, but I think it's an important topic to be fair. Um, to just up here, there's a screenshot or I guess like a chart, sorry, I should say, shared by Albardo Crypto here, where they said six degrees of Tornado Cash is a thing. Even crazier, while only 0.03% of addresses received ETH from Tornado Cash, almost half the entire ETH network is only two hops from a Tornado Cash receiver. And this is, I think, uh, largely in part due to centralized exchanges. You know, a lot of ETH hits centralized exchanges and kind of like goes in and out and all that sorts of stuff. And that ETH would have, you know, touched Tornado Cash at, at one point. And you can see here, 92.66% of the network is only four degrees of, of separation from a Tornado Cash uh, a kind of like receiver. So 
this just shows how like impossible it would be to police uh I, I, like things in terms of kind of like people that have interacted with a um, a contract that he sanctioned or has some kind of like degree of separation but not that much degree of separation from it right so again as i described last week it is unworkable unpoliceable and the front end's going above and beyond to do this is is really stupid i think and i think i think that we really need to keep putting social pressure on here uh to to kind of like reverse this as i said Ave ended up unblocking I guess not just myself, but like everyone after I socially signaled this, um, but and I didn't contact the team. I literally just put out that tweet. I didn't contact the team. I spoke to some friends about it, and I think I put it in the Daily Grade Discord channel where I was like, "What the hell, guys?" But I didn't go to you know the other team and say, "Hey guys, like, can you unblock me?" I didn't like do that because I know that I have uh, uh, kind of like that reach, right? Like I can I can message them and, and and they'll reply to me, but I don't want to do that. I don't want special treatment. I wanted them to. I want that. I wanted that social pressure to basically get them to remove it. Together, and that's what they did. They removed it. I even think they went as far as um, removing the um, the sanctions ad addresses from interacting with um, with uh, with the other front end, uh, which you know. I guess, like, maybe they were going to put that back, but that's fine. I was more, uh, I mean, fine. Fine is relative. But, like, I was more concerned about the people who got, who received 0 0.1 ETH from that troll getting barred from using it. Because I was like, what the hell? Like, I actually felt like a criminal for the... One of the only times in my life, like I, I, I honestly try my best to stay on the right side of the law, but I felt like a criminal when that happened. I was like, holy shit, like I've been sent this uh, and now the, you know, the RF front end is blocking me. It's treating me like I'm a sanctioned individual from the US. Like I, I was just thinking about that. I'm like, this is crazy. What the hell? So I think that the fact that people are being, being made to feel like criminals because of this is really bad as well. And we need to keep fighting back against it. But I think that's it on that topic for today. I've got a bunch of other things I want to get through. But thank you for listening to all of my rants there. If you agree or disagree with anything that I said, please let me know in the Discord channel. There's a lot of good discussion that's been going on in there over the last few days. But I'm going to move on to some more positive stuff, and that's merge-related news. So we have the post-mortem on what happened with Gurley uh, and why we had that kind of like participation rate drop off there. There were, I guess, like multiple issues here. I think the issue with Nimbus accounted for uh, most of the validators being offline. So what happened with Nimbus is that the Nimbus nodes were using an older version of Geth on Sepolia that still allowed for the engine API to be exposed without a JWT token. They reused the setup, but with the latest version of Geth that doesn't allow engine API communication without a JWT token, this broke their setup. The Nimbus node should slowly come back online once the ports and JWT configuration is fixed. The status is partially resolved. Some, some, some nodes still need the, uh, the update. Participation rates climbed above 80% as a result of the fixes. Uh, some nodes are still attesting sporadically. The setup would definitely need to be monitored closely. So I think that uh, this was basically the um, the cause of a lot of the network going uh, kind of like offline or not validating correctly. Uh, and yeah, as you said, as, as I said here, this was just due to some outdated software. So it wasn't anything kind of like critical. It wasn't something with the merge itself. Uh, so it's great to, to see that. And then there were a bunch of other things as well. Uh, loads Star had an issue, Basu had an issue, Nethermind had an issue, Aragon had an issue, right? This is what's going to happen with client diversity is that like, because we have what, 10 clients across both EL and CL, uh, there is going to be more of a chance of these things happening just by virtue of the fact that we have more clients to make sure uh, are kind of like, okay. And maybe you're interested in what happened with the reorg. So the reorg was due to Basu. So it says here, Adrian and the consensus teams have worked on a comprehensive document uh, found here. If you want to kind of like go look into, uh, I guess, under the hood technicals of it. But I guess like the summary or the TLDR is that Basu incorrectly invalidated the canonical chain transition block and the Teku node, uh, propo Teku node sorry, proposed on its own head as expected. A Teku restart reissued all its requests and this time Basu responded correctly, allowing Teku to reorg onto the correct chain. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, like that was just another... Uh, a non, I guess, like critical thing and not something got to do with the, I guess, like merge itself. Uh, and then there was a bunch of other things here, which you can read yourself. You can read this whole postmortem, but I think this is encouraging. I think this is positive. I think the fact that we got back up to over 80%, I think within a few hours, 80% uh, participation rate, which was really good. It's not, on these test nets, it's never going to be like what it is on mainnet with a 99.8% or whatever it is. I think I've mentioned this before. So don't take that as any indication of what it's going to look like on mainnet. I think uh, we're going to just have to see. Like, I mean, we obviously scheduled it. It's about a month from today or pretty much exactly a month if, if it happens on the 15th. Um, we're just going to have to see how it shakes out on mainnet. My guess is that we will have some participation drop off for a multitude of reasons, but it's the, those the, those dropped off validators will probably come back online really, really quickly. I don't think... 
like I'd be very surprised if we saw enough validators drop off that would get us below the 66% threshold, which is needed for finality. I'd be extremely surprised if that happened. But even if it did, I believe the network would recover just fine, just like Gurley recovered because Gurley went under 66%. It was actually a really good test of that. We hadn't seen that on Robston or Sepolia. So it was good to see what it looks like when the network goes under 66%. It functioned as normal. We didn't finalize. Like the network kept producing uh, bl uh, blocks or I guess slots and kept proposing and validating all that sorts of stuff, but we couldn't finalize until those validators came online. Uh, and then once they did and we got above that 66% threshold, then uh, we had fin uh, fin uh, finalization again. So yeah, I, I think it just goes to show like how the beacon chain is a self-healing system, how it can repair itself uh, without the need for like a hard fork or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to see how that shakes out on mainnet, but I expect mainnet to be a smoother process and I expect us to recover much faster from any issues uh, on mainnet than we have on the test nets. And Danny Ryan published his uh, latest edition of Finalized, which is the 36th edition here, which is all about, I guess, the merge, timing around the, the, mer uh, the mainnet merge and everything around that. So if you want the dates, if you want the details, this is the blog post to check out. It is very, very short. So it's just got all the meaty details that you need. I'll link that in the YouTube description as well for you to check out. And I guess like uh, Ben Edgington has another What's New in ETH2 newsletter out as well, which uh, I think is worth, uh, definitely worth reading because it's got more commentary on the mainnet merge, more commentary on Gurley uh, and a bunch of other things that's usually in his newsletter. So definitely check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, final updates here. Rainbow Wallet now uh, makes creating and customizing your ENS profile fun and easy. You can upload a profile picture and cover photo, add your handles and links and organize your NFT showcase. Web3's linked a link in bio easier than ever with Rainbow. So I guess that sounded like an advertisement, but I'm just literally reading the tweet, guys. <laughs> That's not a sponsored spot. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see how the interface looks here in the screenshots, which is really, really cool. You can create your ENS profile, find your name, add your cover, add your profile, everything like that. I think they teased this a few weeks ago and I covered it on the read feel but i uh, kind of like uh, i believe this is now live in the rainbow wallet app so you can go check this out for yourself if you're using rainbow you'd have to i think update the wallet uh, uh kind of like app on your phone but you can go do that if you're a user or if you're not a user you can check it out as a new one all right, finally, uh, I guess like in on the topic of privacy lately with with the Tornado Cash stuff, uh, Aztec did a thread, which is, I guess, like a recap or a highlight of one month in production for Aztec Connect, which I spoke about when they launched it a month ago, which is this kind of like private DeFi relayer at layer two, where you can essentially uh, yank or yank, I guess, tap into layer one Ethereum uh, liquidity and do your transactions all privately from uh, Aztec Connect's network here. Now, I believe Aztec put out a tweet saying that they were going to come out with their stance on everything happening with Tornado Cash. I don't know if I've seen that yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of like reading that as well. But you can go give this thread a read all about Aztec Connect's first month uh, and kind of like a summary of what happened there. I think it's going to be very important to pay attention to what happens with these other privacy tools. Tornado Cash still uh, still works, right? It's on Ethereum. It can't be stopped. It's it's immutable, whatever. Um, but like these other platforms, like Aztec Connect, for example... It's centralized because it's very early. It's like a layer two. It's it's centralized. There's, I believe there's kind of like admin keys. I believe Aztec are the only ones who run kind of like the software for these sorts of stuff. So it's very different to Tornado, to, to Tornado Cash. If if for some reason Aztec was sanctioned like Tornado Cash is, then their whole network would basically go offline. It would you would you would probably have a chance maybe to withdraw your assets. Um, and I don't know how their kind of like um escape patch works on Layer One Ethereum. If it's constructed properly, you should be able to withdraw from Layer One Ethereum even if they were to go offline. Um, but yeah, they would be an easier target because of the fact that their smart con their kind of like system isn't uh, as far as I know decentralized and immutable. Yet, it hopefully will be in the future, but not yet. Same goes for pretty much, I think, all the other privacy tools. Um, I believe like Polygon's Nightfall would, would fall into the same bucket. So yeah, but I don't know. That's the thing. Like I think, as I, went, as I talked about last week, Tornado Cash, I believe, got sanctioned specifically because of the North Korean connections, um, because there was so much volume passing through there, especially from, from North Korea. Does that happen to something like an Aztec if there is a lot of volume with, you know, going through there from North Korea? I don't know. I don't know what this is going to look like. I think it's going to be a very interesting next few years to see what gets sanctioned, what gets kind of like attacked, what can resist these attacks, what can keep uh, being censorship resistant in the face of them. Um, and it's, yeah, it's going to be a real test of Ethereum's decentralization and Ethereum's censorship resistance. And as I've been saying for the entire time I've done these videos and for many years in crypto, guys, 
This is why decentralization matters. This is why what we're building, right, in Ethereum, this is why we haven't sacrificed decentralization for scale. This is why we hold it above all else. Because if you don't have decentralization, you don't have censorship resistance, you don't have anything compelling. All you have is TradFi 2.0 on a blockchain. Who gives a shit about that? I'm not here for that. I'm here to change the world, improve the world, and give people so much more freedom than they have today, especially people in oppressive regimes or people that aren't in kind of like Western democracies that get to enjoy a lot of the freedoms that we do because Ethereum is for everyone. It's not just for people, uh, people in the Western kind of like society. It is for everyone everywhere in the world. World, no matter what country you live in, no matter you know who you are, no matter anything about you, it's for you, right? And you should have a reasonable expectation of being able to access privacy-preserving tools as well on the network, which is what we're fighting for with the censorship resistance, with the decentralization. So take that on board, think about it, stew on it. Come have a discussion in the Discord channel with me. Always love to chat, but I think I'm going to end it there for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.